Alhamdulillah Na'amaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiru Wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina Man yahdi illahu fala mudlala Wa man yudlil fala hadiyala Wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahduhu la sharika lahu Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abdullahi wa rasuluhu صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثتها وكل بدعة ضلالة Certainly our praises are for Allah alone We ask Allah to help us, to aid us, to forgive us, to pardon us We ask Allah to protect us from our own selves and from the deeds that our own hands put forth and the consequences of those bad deeds. Those who are guided, no one or nothing can lead them away from the truth. And those who have not been led and guided to the truth, no one can bring them there too. I bear witness and I testify that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's no God but Allah. And everything that is worshipped besides Allah is false. And no deity deserves to be worshipped except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I also bear witness, and I also testify that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam is the only man who deserves to be absolutely followed and absolutely obeyed without thought, without question, without doubt, without understanding why and how. There's only one man who's followed and obeyed all of the time, no matter the situation and the condition. And that man's name is Muhammad ibn Abdullah. May Allah Azza raise his name. No other man, not from the companions, not from the successors of the companions, not Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Shafi, this scholar, that scholar, no leader, political, ruler, no man on the face of the earth from then until now is listened to and obeyed and followed absolutely. Every single man besides the Messenger of Allah والسلام, is respected, followed conditionally. And that condition B is that what they're telling you to do is the truth. And what they're saying is the truth. And that they support the truth. All men besides the Messenger of Allah والسلام, are only followed. Your father, you can't listen to your father all of the time. You can't, even though it's your father. There has to come a time in which you have to tell your father verbally or physically, I can't, I'm sorry. How dare you disobey me? How dare you talk back? How dare you refuse? Yes, father. And that's a favor to the father. If the father only but knew. As the Messenger of Allah tells us, Help your brother out. Whether your brother is a wrongdoer, or whether your brother is being wronged. And as we know from the principles of the art of war, is that there are orders of the sovereign which are not to be obeyed. There are orders of the son of heaven, quote unquote, which the general on the battlefield cannot listen to, and he shouldn't listen to. And that's a favor for the emperor in reality. When victory is achieved, I told you to retreat, I told you to stop, I told you to withdraw your forces, I know you did, your highness. I'm sorry, but I brought you victory. So no man speaks the truth absolutely 100% of the time, except for Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوهَىٰ عَلَمُهُ شَدِيدُ الْقُوَىٰ Quraysh, they forbade the companions in the early days of Mecca. You listen to this man, you follow this man, you write down what this man says. As Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As r.a. has said, كُنْتُ أَتُبْ كُلَّ مَا أَسْمَعْ مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَىٰهِ وَسَلَىٰهِ Everything that the Messenger of Allah would say, I would write it down. I would write it down. And they would say, you write down from a man? You write down everything that this man says? He speaks when he's happy. He speaks when he's upset. He's a man. He's a human. And as if they cast some type of doubt in his heart. It, it, it bothered him. So he went back to the Prophet complaining what they said and what they told him. And the Prophet he, by Allah's permission, he explained to him the exceptional status that he sh that he has. No one else shares him in that exceptional status. And that is, Uqtub. For wallahi nafsi biyadi, 
لا يخرج منه إلا الحق. He says, keep writing all everything that I say, for nothing comes out of my mouth except for the truth. And that's an exceptional status that only Muhammad ibn Abdullah can enjoy. And of course, the world today and the Muslim world and the world of Islamic knowledge and scholarship would be a better world if we only but understood this. The world would be a better world if we only understood the two main categories of Tawheed. No one is worshipped except Allah. No one. Period. And no one is absolutely followed except for the Messenger of Allah. Period. Simple and easy. And the world would be a better place. أَمَّا بَعَدْ فِي قُولَ الْإِمَامِ الْمُخَالِ رَحِمَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى فِي كِتَابِهِ الْجَامِعِ الصَّحِيحِ حدثنا محمد بن المثنى قال حدثنا عبد الوهاب الثقفي قال حدثنا أيوب عن أبي قلابة عن أنس رضي الله عنه وعن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أنه قال ثلاث من كن فيه وجد حلاوة الإيمان أن يكون الله ورسوله أحب إليه مما سواهما وأن يحب المرء لا يحبه إلا لله وأن يكره أن يعود في الكفر كما يكره أن يعود في النار أو بهذا المعنى Today I want to talk about something which is very important in our lives, extremely important for everyone's life. And regardless of your age, you could be 40, 50, 70, 80, you could be 10, you could be 12, you could be an adolescent, you could be a teenager, you could be someone who is a senior citizen, and regardless of your gender, a woman, a man, male, female, binary, your pronoun, regardless. And of course, in regardless of your status, how much money you have, how much money you make, how handsome you are, how beautiful you are, how unattractive you may be to some. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, as they say. In regardless of your status, whether you walk, whether you drive, whether you're carried, whatever you do in life is important to you. And that thing that is so important in a human being's life from day one to this very day is a word which we call fuel. And if you want, you can say energy. And if you want, you can say gas. The terminology doesn't matter. Fuel, energy, gas, petrol, a power source with an electric car. It matters not. How do you get from point A to point B? I don't own a car. I get on the bus. I take public transportation. The bus, the train travels with what? You do own a car. How do you get from point A to point B? Something is needed for that automobile. You have a business, right? Fuel and energy. How many wars have been started because of fuel and energy? How many wars have been fabricated and placed under the guise of religion? or race, or justice, or freedom, or liberation, or democracy, but in reality they were only fighting for control and domination and amassing fuel and energy. FDR, one of the most iconic presidents in the history of this country, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, many bridges named after him, towns, maybe, streets, blocks, everybody knows Roosevelt or Roosevelt. Big, important president. So after the Second World War, this president, he sent a royal or a presidential de uh, delegation to the Middle East, to the following countries. Of course, he sent them to Iraq. He sent his delegates to Iran. He sent his delegates to Kuwait. He sent his delegates to Bahrain. And of course, he sent his delegates to Saudi Arabia. And he said, you have one mission and one mission only. I want you to be my eyes and my ears of what I'm hearing about, is that there's a large and great, rather limitless source of crude oil we need to know. So he sent his, 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 his delegation, he sent them, they sat with the Arab leaders, they sat with the chieftains, they observed, they enjoyed their hospitality, so on and so on and so forth, and then they returned. Give me what you got, what did you see? Give me your report. The Secretary of State, he's quoted to have said the following to Phrases. Number one, he said the Middle East is, he says, the oil of the Middle East 
is the greatest treasure that nature has left behind in history. The greatest treasure. Of all of the different sources of wealth and power, there's nothing in nature in the history of the human being like the oil of the Middle East. He then said, the influence, the power that will come from control over this oil, politically and militarily, will be very serious. Very serious. And then he said, the Middle East is a galaxy of crude oil. And the sun of that galaxy is Saudi Arabia. So he didn't ask the president, he asked Roosevelt, what will be our share of control? What will be our share of domination? Who will have the highest hand? What will be our percentage? Great Britain, France, these other countries and the other nations, let alone the people who live in those lands. What will be our share from control over this oil? And that is when FDR said nothing less than 100%. End of discussion. Let's go to lunch, fellas. Let's drink. Congratulations on your successful mission. Our portion of control of this oil, of this fuel, of this energy, will be nothing less than 100%. Think about those words. The other Western allies, they won't have 50, 50, 30, 70. We want, we need, and we will have all of the control. Why did he make this statement? Why? Because he knew is that there is no country there's no economy, there's no military, there's no nation without fuel and energy. Something has to keep you moving and going. And the thing that keeps you moving and going has to be strong, has to be pure, and it has to be easily accessed. The people have to have access to their fuel. And if not, nothing will get done. And if it gets done one day, what happens the next day when the fuel runs out? There were wars lost. There were battles lost. There were campaigns lost. Not because they were inferior to their opponents. Not because they didn't have the upper hand or the greater strategy, but because they ran out of fuel. They ran out of bullets. They ran out of ammunition. It's nothing else to shoot with. And that is the importance of the supply line. And that is why they systematically bomb and destroy the supply line of the army. If they have no food to eat, no water to drink, if they have no arrows to shoot, if they have no fuel for their vehicles, their jets, their planes, their, their warships, they can't fight. So a wise person, he knows that fuel, the thing that keeps you running, and the thing that keeps you moving, the things that keep your locomotive, those wheels turning, is of utter importance. So you have to get as much of that fuel and energy as you possibly can. And you have to make sure that fuel and energy is good and clean and suitable for your system. And one who has an abundance of that energy and an abundance of that fuel, the chances of him losing and quitting and dying are slim to none. And a fight, the endurance, and the 10th round, the 11th round, and the 12th round, versus the next fighter, who's a better fighter, but he has nothing less than his gas tank. So a small push, a small punch, he falls down and he can't get back up. So the fuel that you have that keeps you moving and running is of the utmost importance in every single person's life. So I just stop and think about this for one second now. We talk about politics. We talk about wars that are fought in the name of religion and race and so on and so forth. And this president wants you to vote for him. And I'm going to make America great again. I'm going to make this country like this. I'm going to do this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What are you doing for me on a daily basis? When I go to the gas station and the regular fuel is $3.59 a gallon. To fill up my tank is $60, $70, $100, not $95 premium. Are you going to lower the gas prices? Is this war, this invasion, this retaliatory strike, is that going to make the gas prices go lower or higher in this strait and in this gulf? And when these countries go to war and bomb each other, is that going to help out the day-to-day -day America? Is that going to make access fuel more accessible, cheaper, and easier? So these are very important questions with regards to the secular worldly life. So what is the case of the spiritual fuel, the Islamic fuel, the energy that keeps you moving, that keeps you going before, during, and after? Is there such a thing in Islam? Is there a thing that keeps us moving and going, that keeps me praying, fasting, giving zakah, making hajj? I'm depressed, I'm down, I'm sad, I'm sick. I have bills, I have responsibilities, but there's a jolt in my system that allows me to get up 
and to pray, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is there such a thing? And if there is such a thing, how do we get it? How do we obtain it? And how do we put a, a hold on that fuel and that energy source? We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us and to have mercy upon our souls and to make us firm in our graves. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who are Muslim, living, and those who die and are resurrected upon our Islam. Amen. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa. Wa salatullahi wa salamu ala ibadihi ladhi nastafa amma ba'd. Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu tells us that the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam said the following words. Thalathun, yani thalathul khisab. Thalathul khusaf. Thalath sifat. Thalathul mankunna fihi wajda wa fi riwayatin wajda bihinna. Halawat al-iman, ta'ma al-iman. There are three qualities. There are three characteristics. There are three traits. There are three sources of energy and fuel. If the servant has, he will experience the sweetness of faith. Faith will become tangibly tasty to him. As if it was a drink, as if it was a food, as if it was a seasoning, as if it was sugar or honey or molasses. He will find the Prophet ﷺ says, halawa, the sweetness of faith. And the Messenger of Allah tells us in another authentic hadith. ذَكَرَ وَجَدَ الْطَعْمَ الْإِمَانِ مَنْ رَضِيَ بِاللَّهِ رَبًّا وَبِالْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا وَبِمُحَمَّدٍ رَسُولًا صلى الله عليه وسلم Whoever is pleased with Allah as his Lord, whoever is pleased with Islam as his deen, his way of life and death, and whoever is pleased with Muhammad as his messenger, he will find the taste of faith. These three things are and يكون الله ورسوله أحب إليه مما سواه for Allah and His Messenger to be the greatest in your heart, the fondest in your heart, the most beloved of all of those whom you love more than anyone or anything else. End of discussion. Allah and His Messenger, I love more. I love myself. Yes. I love to make money. Yes. I love to sleep. I love to eat. I love my race. I love this. I love that. But I love Allah and His Messenger more. And if it came down to my desires, what I want, and what Allah wants from me, I have to put what Allah wants first. When it comes to my culture, or my opinion, and what the Sunnah clearly states and dictates, I have to follow what the Prophet says in the discussion. Number two, is for you to love a man for no reason except for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it wasn't for Islam, I don't think our paths would have ever crossed. It's from reality. From New York or from Philly. You're of this race. You're from this part. You're from, we, we, our paths would have never crossed. And if our paths did cross, how would they cross? Business, sports, and college, buying and selling, you know, here and there. But for real, for if it wasn't for the dean, we probably wouldn't even know each other. And if it wasn't for the dean, we probably wouldn't even like each other. That's an established thing. I will look down upon you, you will look down upon me. I will find your customs and your food and your dress weird and strange. And you will find mine weird and strange as well. So for a man to love another man for no reason except for Allah. If you love someone indiscriminately, blindly, except because they're a good Muslim, you will experience the sweetness of faith. Last but not least, وَأَنْ يَكْرَهَا أَنْ يَعُودَ فِي الْكُفْرِ كَمَا يَكْرَهُ أَنْ يَعُودَ فِي النَّارِ يَكْرَهَ أَنْ يَعُودَ فِي الْكُفْرِ كَمَا يَكْرَهُ أَنْ يُقْضَى فِي النَّارِ It's for man to hold the idea and the thought of leaving the deen, apostatizing, leaving Islam, going back to kufr. If you used to be a Catholic, you accepted Islam in jail, you accepted Islam in high school, you accepted Islam five years ago, you accepted Islam 20 years ago, or you were born and raised a Muslim. But the thought of waking up and being a Catholic, how is it with that? The thought of darkness, blindness, of nothingness, of eating and drinking and sleeping, and then that's it. The thought of thinking that Allah has partners, and a son, and a wife, and the mother of God, and the thought of kufr and being a Catholic has to be the scariest thought to you. And this, I would rather be thrown in a fire, burnt alive, one of the most painful ways of dying, 
burnt at the stake instead of making a statement outside of Al-Islam and performing an action that takes me outside of the fold of Al-Islam. I.e., in simple terms, the sweetness of faith is supposed to be your what? It's supposed to be your energy. And it's supposed to be your fuel. It's supposed to be the thing that keeps you moving after Ramadan. It's supposed to be the direct influence of you waking up and going to sleep in the manner of Al-Islam. Because being a Muslim, coming to the masjid, fasting the six days of Shawwal, giving charity, it feels so good. It's such a good feeling. It can't be described in words. And only those who have it and have tasted it can relate to it. You pray every day? You're 14, you don't have a girlfriend? You don't chase girls? You don't have a mortgage? You don't deal with riba? You don't have this? You don't do this? What do you mean? They can't understand. They can't fathom what it's like to be a Muslim and to have the sweetness of faith. And that's better and greater than anything else in this world which appears to be sweet. Something which is temporarily sweet, it feels good now, but the regret and the remorse. And anyone who suffers from an addiction and who suffers from fighting that addiction, he knows that every time you relapse and every time you indulge, it feels good. The pressure and the pain of the withdrawal, it hurts. But the moment you relapse, you feel the lowest of the law. And you can literally feel the greasy film on your skin every time you relapse. Dang, I did it again. Unbelievable. I was clean for six months, right back to where I started. So it felt good temporarily, but it comes with a guilt and comes with remorse. But coming to the masjid, what guilt do you feel? <coughs> Fasting, you're hungry, yes. You're thirsty. It's hard the first time you do it, but once you do it, you feel so good. You're willing to do it again. You make hajj. You're tired, you're exhausted, people kicked you, they stepped on you. Lady walks past with a wheelchair over your foot in front of a cobbler. Your toenail comes off, you start bleeding right there in the masjid floor. You go through pain, your son gets lost, someone gets lost, someone steals your passport. All of the drama of Hajj Umrah. But everyone who comes back from Hajj Umrah, what's the first thing that they say? I want to go back. I'm planning my next trip. It felt so good the first time that you saw the Kaaba and being around all Muslims. Not just in the masjid, and only Allah knows if all Muslims are in the masjid. Who knows? There could be disbelievers among us as we speak. We don't know. Could be a monafic as we speak, as indeed the heretic wasn't a Muslim as we speak, recording my words, passing on those words to their bosses. We don't know. Everyone in this building doesn't have to be a Muslim. You never know who's truly a Muslim. Only Allah knows who's a believer. But being in a place in which you're surrounded by Muslims, not just for Jumu'ah, but in the marketplace, in the mall, in the gym, being in Mecca, being in Medina, how does that feel? It can't be described in words. And perhaps one of the reasons why Muslims continue to be righteous after Ramadan and continue to fast and give charity and continue to be generous with their wealth is because they have tasted the sweetness of faith. And the sweetness of faith, I'm comparing it to an energy source. <clears throat> Something that allows you to ignite your engine and to drive for many, many miles. And never ever underestimating the sweetness of faith. Even if your faith may be weak, and even if it falls low at some times, like your gas tank or like your battery, your phone, your iPhone or your Android, whatever your system may be, it's on 2%, it's on 3%. And you'd be shocked what you can do with 2% and how long the phone lasts on 2%, 5%. And you'd be shocked on how far your car can drive just with a little bit of gas because the energy was so important. So the first experience that you had with faith and with knowledge and with Islam is an unforgettable type of euphoria. And that is the fuel for the believer among many other sources of fuel. Now the question is, with regards to these three traits, how does a law or how does a person love a law? How does a person make a law the greatest in his heart? Some of the pious predecessors, they would say, Man araf Allah ahabbahu. He who knows the law will love the law. And whoever loves the law will obey the law. If you know a law, you get to love him. And if you get to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will submit to him and you will obey him. 
So there are three main reasons of obtaining love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You loving Allah, first and foremost. Number one is for you to know Allah's names and attributes. And for you to realize the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the perfection of Allah, the mighty and the most high. His power. And all of his attributes and his characteristics. Number two is for you to look at what Allah has made. And how Allah has created this universe. And how masterfully it was done. And how nothing can come close or compared to what Allah has made. And all of the technological novelties that men have made and come up with, they're nothing more than imitations of Allah's creation. That's a fact. Every, every type of science and technology comes from an animal, a bird, an insect, or a fish. That's a, that's a fact. So they're doing nothing but copying Allah's original creation. Last but not least is look at how many times Allah was merciful to you. And how many times Allah saved you. And how many times you didn't deserve Allah's forgiveness. You didn't deserve Allah's mercy. You didn't deserve Allah to rescue you. And Allah he took you from that difficult situation. That has to instill love for Allah in your heart. And even if your faith is low, it still feels good coming to the masjid. And the moment that you dislike the masjid, and you just like sitting around the believers, and you can't hit, stand to hear the Quran, know for sure that your Iman is at a very critical state. <clears throat> An extremely critical state, almost flat line. Even the sinner knows is that there's a good feeling being around the pious, righteous people, even though a person may not be pious and may not be righteous. Last but not least, a very important point that I want to highlight from this hadith is the second point. And you hibb al mar'u, la yuhibbu illa lillah. It's for a man to love a man, another man, only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake. So we talk about fuel, right? We talk about energy, we talk about wars, we talk about people dominating, right? The gas prices, so on and so forth, to run their economy and to run their military. This is very important. Let's take an example of American history of a short, quick, brief period of time that had a major domino effect to this very day. One of the most iconic figures of the civil rights era, of course, is Malcolm X, or Al-Hajj Malik Shabazz, may Allah have mercy upon his soul. What made him transfer or change from the nation of Islam, or the fruit of Islam, to quote unquote orthodox Islam? or the Sunni Islam, or the Sunni Islam. What, what was the main factor? What were the factors? Were there more than one factor? Perhaps there were several factors. There were political reasons, economic reasons. Maybe, maybe not. But we all know, if you've read the autobiography, if you've seen the movie, etc., etc., we all know one of the main reasons what caused him to make that transformation was what he experienced and what he saw and that taste that he couldn't forget when he performed his pilgrimage. Not in Turkey, not in Egypt, but in the Holy Lands, Mecca and Medina. So when he performed the Hajj, and he made his pilgrimage, realizing the pilgrimage is a part of Islam, he saw that there were other Muslims who weren't black. He saw that there were other Muslims who weren't African American, quote unquote, if you choose to use that term. He saw that there were other Muslims from different ethnicities, Different levels of melanin in their skin. People look different than I. But in the United States, in Chicago, or Boston, or New York, I'm told, and I've been educated, that the Muslims are from this race, so and so and so forth. It had an impact upon him. There was a wake-up call for him. Something is off. Either these people here are fake Muslims from these other races, or these people, what they've been telling me in America, they're incorrect, and they've been misleading me. One of the two. There is no way of harmonizing between the two. Islam is for the black man, and that's it. But I'm on Hajj in the tents of Mina, man from Bangladesh, Pakistan, Iraq, Iran, so on and so forth. Something's off. Number two was the brotherhood that he experienced in that tent, sharing a meal, sharing a bed. Anyone who's made Hajj, if you've never made Hajj, you know that you have an internal bond with your Haji brother. That's a fact. You can see a brother from five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you say we made Hajj together. You never ever forget that brother, that's a fact. Rather, people who made Hajj with your father. Is this not what they say? I made Hajj with your father in 79. Me and your father made Hajj before you were born. Me and your father, we met on Hajj. I learned about this when we were on Hajj. That's that a fact. 
So Hajj is only a few days as Allah tells us in the Quran. Yet still he saw something and he experienced something that changed him. And he got a small slither of a taste of true Islamic brotherhood. These people are kind to me, nice to me, I'm kind to them, I'm, I'm nice to them. Not because we come from the same town, or the same race, or the same ethnicity, but only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake. I.e., as if Malcolm met me, Allah of mercy upon him, he experienced a place, even if it was a short period of time, and even if it was a confined space, lack of racism, lack of colorism, lack of tribalism, and true Islamic brotherhood. We're brothers because of what's in our hearts and not what's on our skin. And subhanAllah, if you look how paradoxical this story is, and no one take this the wrong way, but it's a fact, and we try to speak facts, the lands of the Arabs, the culture of the Arabs, is well known as a documented, documented fact, is one of the most racially established civilizations. And one of the worst places for racism and colorism and tribalism, that's an established fact. So for argument's sake, somebody could have said, you went to the lands of the Arabs, they don't like black people either. They hate black people as well. They look down upon Africans as well. You left them for them. They're both racist. But none of that matters. The only thing that he saw and experienced was in that tent. And right now, me and this brother from Bangladesh, we're sharing a piece of bread for lunch. That's all that matters. And the only reason why we're sharing that piece of bread and that one cup of yogurt and that one uh, thing of water is because of Islam. So that touched his heart. That pierced his heart. And obviously, we know that nothing was the same afterwards. We're turning back to the United States, and we all know the end of the story. And how many people accepted Islam, reverted to Islam, converted to Islam, embraced Islam <coughs> to this very day. For a person to love another person only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how powerful that is, that fuel source. And while the non-Muslims, for many years now, they have worked very hard and blurring that line and watering down and cutting that pure, true oil. Instead of faith, it's nation. And instead of Islam, it's race. And instead of deen and iman, we all love Allah and His message, we all pray, it's where you come from and what you look like and what your passport says. Even though, subhanAllah, 20 years ago, this country didn't exist. Look how stupid some people are by the trick of the shaitan. 50 years ago, there was no such thing as that country. That border didn't exist. That was fabricated after this war. Yet yeah, still, my flag, my nation, my people, my ultimate loyal is for them. Instead of, you're a Muslim, I'm a Muslim, you're a Muslim, and that's all that matters. That's all that matters. But obviously, words are cheap. And talking is cheap and talking is easy. So if you have these three things in you, if you love Allah's Messenger more than anything and anyone else, and if you love people only because of their faith, and if you hate the thought of going back to disbelief more than anything else, then you will experience the sweetness of faith. There are those from among us who have a great portion of this, a big huge chunk. And then there are those from among us who have just a little bit. But the little bit was so strong and so potent that it continues to push you and it continues to drive you, that energy source. And every country is going to protect this energy and it's going to protect this interest. We don't care anything about the Arabs. We don't care anything about these people in this country. We're fighting for our interests. And if you don't realize that, then you're a fool. It's not for freedom or liberation for these people. We can care less about them. We're only fighting and sending our military for protection of that energy source that we must have 100% control of. So these are food, this food for thought for each and every one of us to think about and to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the sweetness of faith and to allow us to keep this sweetness of faith, to keep going and to keep driving with higher heights. Allahumma habdub ilayna al-iman wa zayinu fi qulubina wa ja'alna min al-rashideen wa kabri ilayna al-kufra wa al-fusuqa wa al-asiyan. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifuna wa salamu ala al-musaleen. Walhamdulillahi